Don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment, and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. And if you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. Kabargani. This is Sister Thaj welcoming you to the liberated zone of freedom now. A Pan-Africanist and internationalist world affairs program with the jazzy music mix. Our agenda for this fun drive Saturday, June 17th, 2023. We commence with our ancestor, Didam Kamathi in the African Drumbeat Historical Calendar. Then, this hour, prolific author, radical historian, professor of African American studies, at the University of Houston and Freedom Now co-producer Dr. Gerald Horn interviews Dr. Psyche Williams Forsen, professor and department chair of American Studies at the University of Maryland College Park about our book Eating While Black: Food Shaming and Race in America. As a scholar of black life, especially food and food ways, Dr. William Forsen discusses everything from African American food ways to the importance of food in workplaces and the meanings of Juneteenth beyond food. Our music clip mix includes Alan Toussaint, Kenny Barron, Johnny Otis, Chico Freeman, Art Tatum, Donald Byrd and more. So sit back, get ready to call in to make your pledge this hour at 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Or you can donate online at kpfk.org. And as always, we stand ready for revolution. Take it away, Dr. Horn, with the premiums for this hour. Have you ever wondered why white supremacy is so endemic in North America? Have you ever wondered how and why North America not only wound up with so many enslaved Africans on these shores, but how and why it perpetrated genocide against the indigenous while looting Mexico. Have you ever wondered why and how so many Europeans wound up in North America and spearheaded an economic system, capitalism, that disproportionately benefits those settlers? All the while shouting from the rooftops that this is the greatest nation in the history of the world. Well, wonder no longer we at Freedom Now have got you covered. For a mere $100, receive a signed copy of the book by Gerald Horn, The Dawning of the Apocalypse, The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, Settler Colonialism, and Capitalism in the Long 16th Century. Read this book and understand the role of religion especially Protestants versus Catholics and Christians versus Jewish and Muslims versus Christians in this entire process and understand the religious roots of white supremacy itself, suggesting why it is so hard to get rid of. Read this book and understand the role of Africans and the indigenous in resisting, helping to shape the contours of this nation. So pick up the phone and dial. The number to call is 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Or you can donate online at kpfk.org. Again, that's 818-985-KPFK. 818-985-5735. kpfk.org. Thank you for your donations today. But wait, there's more. Pledge $100 and get a new book by Gerald Horn. Hot off the presses. Revolting Capital. Racism and Radicalism in Washington, D.C., 1900 to 2000. Understand how and why the capital of white supremacy, the capital of this empire, 
has intermittently had a black majority in its capital, leading to its nickname Chocolate City. Understand the role of Marcus Garvey's movement, the Communist Party, the Nation of Islam, unions, the Red Scare, and the Black Scare in shaping both Washington and national politics. Understand how the independence of Nigeria and Jamaica and the sovereignty of Ethiopia led directly to an erosion of U.S. apartheid, that is to say, U.S. Jim Crow. Understand how black Washington has fought back against gentrification, pledged $100 and receive a signed copy of Revolting Capital. But wait, there's still more. Pledge $180 and receive both books, The Donny of the Apocalypse and The Revolting Capital, both for a mere $180, signifying your support for Freedom Now and the radical and revolutionary programming that we deliver every week. The number to call is 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Or you can donate online at kpfk.org. Again, that's 818-985-KPFK. 818-985-5735. kpfk.org. Thank you for your donations today. For all our studies, history is best qualified to reward all research. And when you see that you've got problems, all you have to do is examine the historic method used all over the world by others who had problems similar to yours. And once you see how they got theirs straight, then you know how you can get yours straight. <laughs> Hotep, this is Dinan Kamathi with Freedom Now's African Drumbeat Historical Calendar. This calendar gives life to our revolutionary sheroes and heroes and struggles against slavery, colonialism, imperialism, sexism, and racism. As the United States and NATO's assault against humanity continues, we use these historical lessons to remind us that the people's power is greater than Western military technology. June 16, 1680, Nandi was a Zulu mother warrior of the great African leader Shaka Zulu. She fought European slave traders and helped organize an all-female militia, which has numerous successes against the British. She trained Shaka Zulu. June 16, 1976, June 16 is celebrated as Youth Day in South Africa in commemoration of the over 10,000 students who rose up against the racist South African regime's Africana Medium Degree Program, which forced all African schools in South Africa to learn the Dutch language Africana. The Black Consciousness Movement, the Pan-African Congress, and the African National Congress had a history of doing underground political organizing in Soweto. Targeted by the students for destructions were beer halls and liquor stores, which many African students believe were used by the European government to control African people. Over 600 students were killed. June 18, 1858, Lakshmi Bai was born. She's a national heroine of India, a rebel military leader of India's war of independence against British colonialism. She died at the age of 30 on the battlefield of Gwalior. She was a wrestler, boxer, and athlete as well as a revolutionary organizer. Her women's brigade was called the Amazon of Jahanzi. She specialized in giving training to women as troopers and gunners in their liberation army. June 16, 1862, legal slavery was abolished in the United States. June 18, 1953, Egypt, Kemet, becomes republic under leadership of its first president, Mohammed Naguib was born in the Sudan. President Naguib and Gabo Abdul Nasser were the primary leaders of the Egyptian Revolution of 1952, which was led by the Free Officers Movement founded in 1949. The Free Officers Movement was a group of young officers, 
all under 35, from peasant and working class backgrounds that were fiercely anti-British colonialists and led Egypt to independence. June 18, 1954, the CIA invades and overthrows the democratically elected government of President Jacob Arbenz Guzman. President Arbenz put forth new policies such as giving unused lands by private corporations to the landless peasants. United States multinational corporations, in particular United Fruit Company, which is today Chiquita Brands International, lobbied to overthrow this democratically elected government. Following the coup d'etat, the Guatemalan Civil War begins. This involves a massacre of hundreds of thousands of indigenous Mayan Indians, characterized as genocide. This war prompts a mass migration of Guatemalans to the United States. June 19, 1865. Africans in Texas are notified of Emancipation Proclamation, which was issued in 1863. Juneteenth marks the event. June 19, 1960. Emma Tanyaka was born, a Chicana labor activist and a member of the Texas Communist Party. She led the Pecan Shellers strike in 1933 in San Antonio, Texas, to oppose wage cuts of the already super low wages of five cents per day. Over 2,000 Pecan workers went on strike at over 130 plants. Strikers were tear gassed, beaten, and jailed before victory was won. June 19, 1937. Trinidad in the Caribbean. The British colonial police are defeated in their efforts to beat back oil worker strikers under the leadership of union organizer Uriah Butler. Uriah Butler stated that unemployment and low wages in Trinidad were the work of the evil white men who control the colony and above all else the evil oil magnates. This strike ushered in a new radical political leadership that led Trinidad to independence. June 19, 1965, Algerian President Ahmed Ben Bella was arrested and deposed after leading Algeria to independence in a rapid nationalization of Algeria's land and industries. June 19, 1968, the Solidarity Day March of Poor People in the U.S. This mass march establishes the squatter settlement named Resurrection City, which has represented Native Americans, Chicanos, and poor whites together with Africans. This campaign brought to the front door of the White House the massive poverty in the United States. June 20th, 1920, Eduardo Mudalani was born. He served as a president of Frelimo, the front for the liberation of Mozambique. Frelimo led a guerrilla war against Portuguese colonialism. Frelimo led the reconstruction of a socialist Mozambique. In 1969, he was assassinated by a bomb planted in a book sent to him by the Portuguese secret police, P.A. June 20th, 1941. CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, was founded by James Farmer. CORE used the principles of nonviolence to fight Jim Crow segregation. CORE's principal tactics were freedom bus rides in the South and the desegregation of schools in the North. CORE, in alliance with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the NAACP, organized Freedom Summer campaigns to struggle against the political disenfranchisement of Africans. June 20th, 1960. Mali, formerly the Sudanese Republic, gains independence from France under leadership of Modipa Keita, who forms a Pan-Africanist and Socialist nation. June 20th, 1960. Senegal gains independence from France. June 20th, 1967. Raw boxing heavyweight champ Muhammad Ali was convicted of violating the selective service laws by refusing to be drafted in the U.S. Army to fight Vietnamese. June 20th, 1980, 10,000 African workers in South Africa struck against multinational corporation General Motors, Ford, and Goodyear Corporation over poor working condition and wages. June 21st, 1943, in Detroit, Michigan, race rebellion breaks out and lasts for over three days before federal troops were moved in. Rumors that a white woman was raped sparked European youth to assault Africans. Africans fought back destroying European businesses with over 34 dead and 433 people wounded. 
This has been the African Drumbeat Historical Calendar here at Freedom Now. This afternoon's program can be reheard for the next 60 days at kpfk.org. Audio archives scroll to Freedom Now. Have you ever wondered why white supremacy is so endemic in North America? Have you ever wondered how and why North America not only wound up with so many enslaved Africans on these shores, but how and why it perpetrated genocide against the indigenous while looting Mexico? Have you ever wondered why and how so many Europeans wound up in North America and spearheaded an economic system, capitalism, that disproportionately benefits those settlers. All the while shouting from the rooftops that this is the greatest nation in the history of the world. Well, wonder no longer. We at Freedom Now have got you covered. For a mere $100, receive a signed copy of the book by Gerald Horn. The Dawning of the Apocalypse, The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, Settler Colonialism, and Capitalism in the Long 16th Century. Read this book and understand the role of religion, especially Protestants versus Catholics and Christians versus Jewish and Muslims versus Christians in this entire process and understand the religious roots of white supremacy itself, suggesting why it is so hard to get rid of. Read this book and understand the role of Africans and the indigenous in resisting, helping to shape the contours of this nation. So pick up the phone and dial. The number to call is 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Or you can donate online at kpfk.org. Again, that's 818-985-KPFK, 818-985-5735, kpfk.org. Thank you for your donations today. But wait, there's more. Pledge $100 and get a new book by Gerald Horn, Hot Off the Presses, Revolting Capital. Racism and Radicalism in Washington, D.C., 1900 to 2000. Understand how and why the capital of white supremacy, the capital of this empire, has intermittently had a black majority in its capital, leading to its nickname Chocolate City. Understand the role of Marcus Garvey's movement, the Communist Party, the Nation of Islam, Unions, the Red Scare, and the Black Scare in shaping both Washington and national politics. Understand how the independence of Nigeria and Jamaica and the sovereignty of Ethiopia led directly to an erosion of U.S. apartheid, that is to say, U.S. Jim Crow. Understand how Black Washington has fought back against gentrification Pledge $100 and receive a signed copy of Revolting Capital. But wait, there's still more. Pledge $180 and receive both books, The Donnie of the Apocalypse and The Revolting Capital, both for a mere $180, signifying your support for Freedom Now and the radical and revolutionary programming that we deliver every week. The number to call is 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Or you can donate online at kpfk.org. Again, that's 818-985-KPFK, 818-985-5735, kpfk.org. 
Thank you for your donations today. From KPFK Los Angeles, this is Gerald Horn for Freedom Now. On the line with me is Professor Psyche Williams Forson, Professor and Chair of the Department of American Studies at the University of Maryland at College Park, author of a number of books, including Eating While Black, Food Shaming and Race in America. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles, Professor Williams Forson. Thank you. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Well, thank you for joining us. So why did you write this book, Eating While Black? Eating While Black was written because... It was a follow-up in some ways to my first book, Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs, Black Women, Food and Power, which I'm happy to talk more about um, as we as we go forward in the conversation. But essentially, I wrote the book because in the years between that first publication, which came out in 2006, and I'd say the next decade um, or so, you know, a lot of changes were happening in the food world. Um, dollar stores began getting refrigeration. We, there was a, a renewed push to grow one's own food. Um, there was a lot of labeling happening in ways that did not um, happen in years previously. Everyone um, was starting to define themselves as, you know, vegetarian, vegan, pescatarian. You know, uh, very few people were saying carnivore. Um, but just labeling going on. And that was fine, except it was coming with a lot of moralizing. Um, we started hearing, or at least I started hearing for the first time, the label of or the phrase, I eat clean, um, all of which are suggestive of non-clean eaters and a lot more um, indictments around uh, people who were choosing not to grow food or participate in a local food movement. There was a lot of indictments around um, why we should grow food, a lot of judging happening. And so I felt like it was a lot of this was taking place um, in an anti-Black racism framework, quite frankly. It was Black people, you know, need to be policed and our bodies still need to be surveilled in ways that um, actually don't need to be happening, right? And so I saw this taking place in the food uh, world conversation, so I felt like it had to, some attention had to be drawn to it, at least to open up the conversation. So give me an example of food shaming with regard to Black people. Well, you know, I think all of us uh, may food shame at some point in time in our lives, intentionally or unintentional. But let me give you a couple of examples of intentional food shaming. Um, we all heard about the police being called on folks uh, barbecuing in Oakland, right, grilling. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so here we have to, you know, the police are being called for an action that is very innocu innocuous, an action that happens all the time, right? The young man, uh, who was waiting for the rest of his party in Starbucks, right? Um, and there was some need to feel like the police had to be called. So it's not always specifically about the food. It could be in a food context. Black folks taking food out of their cars at an Airbnb <clears throat> have the police called on them because they don't appear to be the right people for that neighborhood. Now, more specifically, let's talk about an actual food circumstance. I opened the book with an instance of an African-American or a Black um, DC Metro uh, driver, rider, uh, employee um, eating on the, on the Metro train. And um, an, uh, a, a visitor on the train or a patron of the train decided to take a picture of this woman and put it on social media. <clears throat> And, um, you know, said, you know, WMATA, 
Washington Metro Area Transfer Authority. Um, I thought we couldn't eat on the train, but here you have an employee doing this. Now, there was no reason for her, uh, the, her being the photographer, the person who took the photograph to do that. And there certainly was no reason for her to post it and try and shame this woman by putting it on, on Twitter. And so what was the purpose of her um, surveilling and then exposing this, this black woman um, as if she was somehow an authority? As it turned out, um, the, the WAMADA worker or employee knew what the policy was, which had recently changed. So she felt like she could eat on the train. And when asked how she would respond uh, to this appeared uh, indiscretion, uh, the WAMADA employee said to the woman who took her picture, worry about yourself, right? <laughs> which is absolutely on point. Worry about your own business, your own life as opposed to worrying about the lives of black folks who know what we're supposed to do and who know how we're supposed to move about this earth. And so um, that's one instance. I, there are several others that I give in the book that are based on my experiences in the last decade. Mm -hmm. So you curated an exhibit, Fire and Freedom, for the National mm -hmm. Library of Medicine. What did that involve? Mm -hmm. Well, it involved, they reached out to me because they wanted to create an exhibit about foodways in Chesapeake and the role of, of Black women in particular. And so after a lot of conversation, um, they wanted to primarily focus on Martha Washington, who is um, or who was um, or uh, is the wife of, of, of George Washington and whose home, Mount Vernon, is right here in, the, in Northern uh, Virginia. And so they wanted to sort of spotlight that, but they wanted to include black women, right? And so we ended up um, reversing that narrative and centering on black people um, and their food cultures of the Chesapeake. And we looked at the ways in which water or waterways factors into or factored into that life experience. Um, we looked at the um, misperceptions of the hearth as being only a place of warmth, but also as a space of danger for those who were working in and around the hearth uh, during that time period, which was the late 1700s. Uh, we looked at the ways in which uh, the entire domestic space was not one that people tend to assume uh, to be easier than uh, field labor. Right. But it, it came with its own challenges of, again, constant surveillance. It came with the danger of uh, being accused of trying to poison a family or put glass in their food. It came with um, dangers of heat. Your clothes could catch fire while you're doing a thousand different things. So I wanted to draw attention to the ways in which um, the exhibit focused on food, but there are all of these elements that we don't get when we focus on the sound bite and the ways in which regardless of how well a, a, a house uh, domestic or a, a person, an enslaved person who was in the, uh, in the plantation home may have had it regardless of the number of liberties they may have been given, freedom for their selves and their, their family and their loved ones was always at the forefront of their mind. Right. Mm. Freedom was always an agenda uh, during enslavement. And so while they were surrounded by water, which could have been a, a, an avenue for freedom, that same water prevented them from escaping as easily as they may have liked. But it's the whole notion that freedom uh, was always at the forefront of the minds of, of enslaved people. You also curated an online exhibit, Still Cooking by the Fireside, African-Americans and Food Service. Talk to us about that and elaborate on the point you made previously, uh, this mm -hmm. notion that enslaved cooks and food preparers oftentimes were involved in seeking to poison their so-called masters. Yeah, so um, the... Um, Still Cooking by the Fireside was an exhibit I did many, many, uh, several decades ago, early on, where I focused on the roles of enslaved people in um, working, for example, in saloons, working in food uh, um, spaces, because unlike what we are told, um, one of the things I detail in building houses out of chicken legs are the ways in which 
uh, early enslaved Africans and uh, native people, native and indigenous people <clears throat> would vend and hawk um, at, or, or be hucksters with various food items. Some enslaved people were allowed to have uh, gardens. For example, uh, Charles Ball, who was an ex-slave here in the Virginia area, he talks about the ways in which he was, as a fisherman, able to get extra fish and he could sell it along uh, different roadways and make a few dollars for himself. George Washington in his record talks about um, many of his enslaved, um, the many of the enslaved on that plantation, uh, he bought the foods that they grew, right? So I, I focus on the ways in which enslaved people um, had some elements of, of movement, freedom of movement, to be able to sell various foodstuffs from gardens, from what uh, what they trapped, from what they caught, um, or what they um, where they fished. But also you had some who worked in, again, taverns and places of this nature. So I just sort of highlight some of the very um, uh, basic levels in which African-Americans have been involved in food service, which was an avenue of freedom unto itself for many of us, caterers, um, as, as entrepreneurs, right? We were in catering, we were in hospitality spaces. Um, we may have owned a tavern or two, for example, um, Samuel Francis, who is both in some places cited as white, but in the resources I found was African-American tavern owner. And so I just highlight those elements in that particular exhibit. As far as enslaved people poisoning um, those who uh, enslaved them, absolutely they did in some instances. And the record indicates this because you will find um, sources where there will be literal anecdotes published in magazines in the event that someone found themselves poisoned by the help, right? And so um, they didn't just poison, um, you know, African, early Africans and African American people um, understood, some of us understood herbs and herbology. We understood sorcery. We understood what we would call witchcraft, but what they would, what they would call um, mixing up um, herbs and potions for different healing elements. Some of those elements maybe didn't heal quite as well, right? And they could kill because that's with anything. Um, but in, in some insurrections, in some revolts, um, enslaved women in particular aided in that process by um, grinding up glass or what have you. Because here's the other thing about those who worked in the household. They had a lot of information about the planters or the farmers with whom they lived. They knew their work life cycles, they knew their sleep cycles, they knew their movements. They had to because they were in charge of the domestic sphere. So because they knew all of this information, um, and even though they were considered invisible, even though they were standing right there, they were considered invisible, um, they were able to use that information to obtain freedom in any way that they could. You see this very well illustrated um, in the uh, series Underground. Um, if you've watched that, it was the, you know, John Lennon, um, uh, one of the John Lennon productions. If you ever watched that uh, series uh, of the Making Eight, um, you would find at the very beginning of that series in episode one or two, perfect examples of the ways in which those who worked in the household knew exactly what was happening um, and aided in, in overthrowing or helping others get to freedom. By the way, Professor Williams Forson, what you're saying obviously challenges the old trope, drawing a oh. distinction between so-called passive house Negroes and so-called rebellious field Negroes. That's right. I said right. that, um, how has nutrition science and public policy uh, intersected with racism to shape food choices? Yeah, you know, um, it has intersected in a way that um, has done Black folks and, and folks of color uh, a huge disservice. For example, 
Recent documentation has suggested that the BMI is not the best standard by which to determine one's healthiness because of body design, body genetics, etc. What do I mean by that? Um, early on, we knew that, for example, Sarjay Bartman, um, who was considered the hot and tot Venus, was placed on display in the UK um, and her body shamed and, and perceived to be unruly, right? Because she had large breasts, she had wide hips, she had huge buttocks. That's part of the culture of that particular African uh, community, African tribe. But when you measure it against European standards, and that standard gets perceived as the only standard by which others are measured, then science comes in and says, yeah, if you don't look like this, then your body's unruly and it's unhealthy. So how many calories does it take to get your body to look this way, right? And what becomes very interesting in today's um, environment are the number of folks who are going to get the Brazilian butt lift or what have you, the BBL, in order to have bigger hips, bigger butt. Whereas, you know, for so long, Black folks were told that is not beautiful, that is not healthy. And yet we see folks every day plumping up their lips, plumping up other parts of their bodies in order to achieve the very uh, beauty that Black folks have had since time immemorial. So, you know, science has worked in that way with the BMA. They've also recently come out You'll see it if you Google it anywhere to say that the Mediterranean diet is far healthier than the Southern diet. Southern in this instance being actually translated into probably soul food. But the reality is that Southern food, vegetables, fruits, etc., cetera, um, are not unhealthy. Now, how many Southerners may cook might uh, render it unhealthy because you cook with whole milk, whole butter, sugar, salt to season the food very, very, uh, quite a bit, right? To put in a lot of seasoning. The reality is, however, soul is not so much how things are cooked, but it's a way of thinking about how things are cooked. In addition to using all the seasonings that we do, because we put in a little bit of this, we put in a little bit of that. We're like, well, let's make it taste like this. Let's make it taste like that. But that's part of um, a way of being, right? We like for stuff to be hyped up as Black people. We like for things to taste good. We like for them to, you know, we use the word, it's funky, it's this, it's that, in, in beautiful ways, right? Whether it's our hair, our music, our clothes, our, our way of walking, our way of talking, we're going to always put in a little extra, right? That translates to how we cook our food right? Um, as the late Verda May Grosvenor said, who was a culinary historian of the Gullah region, of the Gullah Geechee region, she said, you know, we cook by vibration. Black folks don't really season. We just, I, mean, I feel like I need a little bit more of this. I feel like I need a little bit more of that. Well, that particular way of cooking and that cultural way of being is now, according to society, um, unhealthy. Right. And that's not new. It's always been considered unhealthy. Whatever black folks do, if we, we move too much, we, we are too loud. We, we are too to this. We're to that. Yeah, all of which is, is craziness, but it's part of the agenda of anti-black racism that not only wants our culture, but doesn't want the burden of being black. But it also wants to demonize our culture. And many of us buy into that colonized mind. And we shift and we move and we try to do this and we try to do that in order to be accepted by the society. But one of the things I say in Eating While Black, and I take this from Melissa Harris Perry, uh, who used to have a Melissa Harris Perry show on MSNBC. She talks about in her book, Shame, she talks about the crooked room and the crooked chair. Most of us are sitting in a chair that's upright Black folks are sitting in chairs that are upright, but the room is crooked. And we try to balance, you know, it carefully in the chair to try to make the chair straight. Well, the chair is straight. It's the room is crooked. 
So no meaning, no matter how much you try and adjust yourself to fit into these United States and the ways in which this society operates, you may not be successful because the society wasn't built for you, though you built it. The society wasn't built for you. So it operates in ways that you're not going to necessarily reach those levels of success or acceptance because you're in a straight chair, but in a crooked room. If I may bring this back to food very quickly, there's a young woman, I talk about this in the book, there's a young woman who, who was telling a major speaker at our university about all the food she gave up. And she was giving her testimony and we were happy for her. At the end of her testimony, he said to her, that's an extreme reaction to what I was saying. And I felt bad for that sister because she was trying to give her testimony and she was trying to be like, yeah, yeah you know, I'm down with what you're saying. I'm, I'm on point. I'm on top of it. So for him to respond by saying your reactions are extreme. Um, I'm like, and this it wasn't just one person it was multiple. And that was his response. Um, well, you're not going to get that um, approval that you may be seeking because no matter how you may give up or what you may add, you're probably never going to be able to do it just right. Hmm. By the way, the aforementioned Madam Bart, uh, uh, Sergey Bartman, the so-called hot and hot Venus, was in Western Europe approximately two centuries ago, as the audience might recall. And the Western Europeans were so taken with her body, her buttocks, her hips, her breasts, that they wound up stuffing her like you would stuff a giraffe, mm -hmm. for example. It was only after South African independence post-1994 that uh, that body was returned for mm -hmm. proper burial. In any case, Professor Williams Forson, what will be the impact of climate change on the food supply? Yeah, well, you know... In the next couple of decades, we have our work cut out for us, right? Um, the shifting climate changes uh, that we are experiencing now from drought to snow or the lack thereof to um, excess flooding and, and rain. Um, we're already starting to see it and between it and environmental deregulation uh, leading to uh, train um, derailments, et cetera, which then cause um, all kinds of pollutants into our atmosphere. The fact that places like Flint and Jackson still don't have clean water, we're already starting to see it. And uh, we're seeing it also in the taste of the foods that we're able um, to, to get from and, and see represented in the farmer's market. You're seeing smaller versions of food or, or fresh fruits and vegetables going bad a whole lot quicker, even though some of that could be because of the absence of pesticides. It also could be because it's growing, but it's not growing in healthy soil. Um, for many years uh, growing up, you know, we grew various fruits and vegetables without pesticides and they lasted far longer than what we're seeing today. And I, I always think about being, because um, I'm from rural Virginia, but also from Buffalo, New York. Um, but at one point I went back home and I bought some peaches from a roadside vendor. And from the time we left um, the house of worship where my dad was preaching that, uh, where he, my dad preaches, to the time we got home, which is a 45 minute drive, those peaches had turned brown and they were soft and, and so forth and so on. So I was like, wow, this is very different from when we grew up and would do a similar kind of thing and they would last us a couple of days. So I attribute that in part to the soil, to the, to the, uh, the, the lack of climate uh, or the lack of temperatures that we need for, for these foods to grow to maturity um, or in some cases where they're growing too quickly for example, in the D.C. area right now, we're having the, the Cherry Blossom um, Festival, but it's, it's a little bit earlier than we're used to seeing. Um, we're going it, to, it's going to be dicey going on uh, from here on out. Canning is probably a good idea. 
um, you know, freezing and preserving foods to the best that, uh, ways that we can. Um, understanding how our food supplies work. We saw some of this also during uh, the pandemic or the height of the pandemic, I should say, because I think we're not quite 100% out of it. Uh, but in the height of the pandemic, with the shutting down of the food supply, um, people going without, we're going to see more of that, I think, in the years to come. And and it's going to be dovetailing with more and more dis-ease, um, either from pandemics or from um, other kinds of, of rapid dispensing of of, of of illnesses um and it's going to affect how our bodies absorb food whether or not we are going to get the necessary nutrients that we need um and and and, and whatnot so i think that we're going to see a quite a bit more of this happening on the horizon in the years uh to come there's no reason that flint should not have water let's be clear no reason that jackson should be without water at this point um but but here's where we are. And I don't think this is the last of it uh, that we're seeing here uh, in these times. Mm. Speaking of what is to come, Professor Williams Forson, what is the next frontier for critical food studies of which you are a pioneer? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, critical food studies is is um, maybe a subfield of food studies. Um in the sense that we center the study of race, gender, class, um, ability, sexuality, those critical variables that often get dismissed in broader conversations of food. And, you know, there are going to be folks out there that say, well, you know, everything doesn't have to come down to race, but it does. Um, <laughs> we live in a society that was founded and based on racial discrimination. Um, so absolutely everything is uh, intersects with race. And so when you put these variables at the center of the conversations around food, that's when you can begin to understand and see how anti-Black racism functions. Um, that's when you can begin to see um, where uh, communities of people are being resilient in the ways in which they go about navigating, as you said, climate change in order for communities to find themselves able to eat on a continuous basis. When you put age at the center of a conversation, age, race, and ethnicity at the center of conversations about food, that's when you can begin to see viability in allowing people the room to eat from places like the dollar store or other bodegas or corner markets because not only it's a, about a matter of taste, but it's also about a matter of accessibility. Because let's be clear, I can also live in the suburbs and not have access to food. Or I can live in the suburbs and choose to eat out all the time, which means I'm not eating as healthy as I would like to believe I am simply because I make a higher salary. Um, so critical race studies and the work that's on the forefront is looking at uh, issues of incarceration and sugar um, uh, uh, around food uh, conversations, which uh, Dr. Shanti Reese is working on. We're also going to be um, hearing more about other Black women who we don't hear as much about in the conversations around food studies like um, B. Smith, which uh, Dr. Kimberly Nettles, uh, Barcelona is working on. Dr. Monica White, who's working on uh, food-related issues as uh, as it pertains to Black farmers. That work is coming out. And then there's always going to be um, a number of uh, conversations involving the plethora, <laughs> the many, many, many foods that Black folks eat. There's a wonderful new book out called... Um, well, there's Burgers and Blackface, but there's another one by Dr. Naoyo Kwate, who just published her new book um, on uh, restaurants and um, uh, uh, public spaces and the ways in which Black folks have been shut out of those restaurants um, since time immemorial, but at the from a franchise and an owning point of view and the ways in which um, uh, these these particular entities 
primarily did not begin to open up for black folks and ownership until various movements came into being. So you're going to be seeing a lot more work about that. You're going to be seeing work about liquor stores um, and the things that we drink, the things that we um, eat beyond talking only um, about soul food. So I think it's going to be some exciting work coming out. We should we should continue to be on the lookout um, for these for these new works. Now, um, Professor uh, Quate's book, White Burgers, Black Cash, Fast Food, and Black Exclusion from uh, from Black Exclusion to to Exploitation. Um, just some phenomenal work coming out where we are starting to ask people to take a different look at the ways in which we understand Black people and food. Finally, Professor Williams Forsen, author of the book, Eating While Black, Food Shaming and Race in America. You are a professor at the University of Maryland at College Park on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. Uh, would you recommend youth in our audience to matriculate at your campus, either as an undergraduate or a graduate student? Of course I would. <laughs> of course. No, university. I, I, I actually, I, I, I received my MA and my PhD from the University of Maryland. Um, and now um, I've returned to, to chair the department from which I received my degrees. So, yeah, I, I, I am a believer in the Maryland Terrapin uh, way of, of, of doing business and the ways of educating um, young people. Um, I highly recommend American Studies. We're one of the programs on the East Coast who center uh, social justice and social action um, as primary areas of, of study within the field of American Studies. Um, American Studies explores the, um, uh, the world uh, through a U.S. lens, but also globally and transnationally from all of the different perspectives I've talked about here today, from popular culture to visual culture. We have um, some wonderful uh, digital humanities people. Um, our campus um, just um, is uh, launching an anti-Black racism minor, um, of which um, I'm a part because I'm a part of the College of Arts and Humanities. Five different colleges came together uh, to uh, launch this initiative. We also have an anti-racism initiative. And, you know, we're also right outside the, uh, as you said, Washington, D.C. So we're surrounded by um, national museums of the Smithsonian, um, of which there are many. We are surrounded by the National Archives. So we have just, not only do we at the University of Maryland have um a, a wonderful strategic plan and a way of educating all people, uh, but we're also located in an area that is, um, though pricey, it is very much undeniably one of the cultural centers of the United States, I believe. Um, as I said, you know, I, I did both of my uh, advanced degrees here, and so I, I do believe in, in the mission of my unit, as well as that of the university in educating people from diverse points of view, from public health to economics, to business, to public policy. Um, we've got a lot going on at the University of Maryland. So yes, I highly recommend. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Professor Williams Forson, author of the book, Eating While Black, Food Shaming and Race in America. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Pacifica Radio from Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have you ever wondered why white supremacy is so endemic in North America? Have you ever wondered how and why North America not only wound up with so many enslaved Africans on these shores, but how and why it perpetrated genocide against the indigenous while looting Mexico? Have you ever wondered why and how so many Europeans wound up in North America and spearheaded an economic system, capitalism, that disproportionately benefits those settlers. All the while shouting from the rooftops that this is the greatest nation in the history of the world. 
Well, wonder no longer. We at Freedom Now have got you covered. For a mere one hundred dollars, receive a signed copy of the book by Gerald Horn, "The Dawning of the Apocalypse: The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, Settler Colonialism, and Capitalism in the Long Sixteenth Century." Read this book and understand the role of religion, especially Protestants versus Catholics and Christians versus Jewish and Muslims versus Christians in this entire process, and understand the religious roots of white supremacy itself, suggesting why it is so hard to get rid of. Read this book and understand the role of Africans. And the indigenous in resisting, helping to shape the contours of this nation. So pick up the phone and dial. The number to call is eight one eight nine eight five KPFK. That's eight one eight nine eight five five seven three five. Or you can donate online at kpfk dot org. Again, that's eight one eight nine eight five KPFK. Eight one eight nine eight five five seven three five kpfk dot org. Thank you for your donations today. But wait, there's more. Pledge one hundred dollars and get a new book by Gerald Horn, hot off the presses. Revolting Capital: Racism and Radicalism in Washington D.C., nineteen hundred to two thousand. Understand how and why the capital. Of white supremacy, the capital of this empire has intermittently had a black majority in its capital, leading to its nickname Chocolate City. Understand the role of Marcus Garvey's movement, the Communist Party, the Nation of Islam, unions, the Red Scare, and the Black Scare, in shaping both Washington and national politics. Understand. How the independence of Nigeria and Jamaica, and the sovereignty of Ethiopia, led directly to an erosion of U.S. apartheid, that is to say, U.S. Jim Crow. Understand how Black Washington has fought back against gentrification. Pledge one hundred dollars and receive a signed copy of Revolting Capital. But wait. There's still more. Pledge one hundred eighty dollars and receive both books: the Donny of the Apocalypse and the Revolting Capital, both for a mere one hundred eighty dollars, signifying your support for Freedom Now and the radical and revolutionary programming that we deliver every week. The number to call is eight one eight nine eight five KPFK. That's eight one eight nine eight five five seven three five, or you can donate online at kpfk dot org. Again, that's eight one eight nine eight five kpfk, eight one eight nine eight five five seven three five kpfk dot org. Thank you for your donations today. And in closing, we'd like to thank everybody who donated this hour. Thank you to our guest, Dr. Psyche Williams Forsen. Thank you to our producers. Dr. Gerald Horn, Sister Flora, Sister Femi, Brother Brandon, our board op Wendell. Thank you, Matt Perez, and all those who made today's program possible. Please stay tuned for more fun drive programming here at KPFK. Signing off. This is Sister Thage, and until next week, as always, we stand ready for revolution. <laughs>